Hi everyone, we're about to resume the hearing. So if everyone can take their seats, please, so that we can hear from our last two groups of witnesses. Thank you. So since we took a quick recess, everyone, please be quiet. Thank you. I will now turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that she can re we can reestablish a quorum. I'll now turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so we can reestablish a quorum. I need one minute, oh, 30 oh. seconds. Okay. Um, as we wait, I would like to acknowledge Dr. William Smart from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Los Angeles. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm ready. Thank you. So we'll now turn to Parliamentary and Johnson so that we can reestablish a quorum. Yes, Madam Chair. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Present. Member Bradford. Here. Member Tabaki. Here. Member Grills. Present. Member Lewis. Present. Member Holder. Here. And member uh, Step here. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the committee. I'm sorry, on the task force. Five are necessary for a quorum. There are eight members present. A quorum has been reestablished. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been reestablished, we will now return uh, to um, our expert witnesses. Ms. Virgin Lassage and Mr. Ruben Carranza from the International Center for Transitional Justice, who will be giving us a primer on domestic and international reparations initiatives and models. Thank you for your patience, Ms. Lassage and Mr. Carranza. Uh, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you very much, Chair Moore. Do you hear me okay now? We need the volume up a bit, and if you can speak up as well, that would be great, Ms. Lassage. And okay. also, thank you, Professor great. Bush, I will... for waiting. <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity to come speak with you. I really wish we could be there in person in warm Los Angeles so we wouldn't have all these challenges. Um, but I'm calling in from Washington, D.C., and my colleague Ruben Carranza is calling in from New York. Uh, we are here on behalf of the International Center for Transitional Justice. You can go to the next slide, please. Just very, very briefly, by way of introduction, ICDJ is an international nonprofit organization with our headquarters in New York and offices in six countries around the world. We work side by side with victims to obtain acknowledgement and reparations for massive human rights violations, to hold those responsible and reform and, and build democratic institutions and prevent the recurrence of violence and repression. The way we do this is through a few different approaches and include sharing relevant comparative examples. And as I was saying, 
as the ch the panelists before us noted, no two cases are the same. Um, but we have found in our work across the world that there are certain similar challenges that reparations initiatives come across and some strategies that might provide insight or inspiration for the context that you're working in. But we also provide targeted and context-specific technical support to advise victims, civil society, and governments um, that are developing reparations proposals, including and in helping in the drafting of the legislation and implementation process. We also work to convene relevant stakeholders in strategy sessions as a way of developing um, solutions to challenges and moving the work forward. Next slide, please. So in our brief time with you today, um, my colleague Ruben and I are gonna share a few examples of reparations programs from other countries that we believe can provide some helpful insights for your work in California, especially as you move into the phase of design and implementation. Um, you know, we don't have much time, so I encourage you to go to our website, icdj.org, to see uh, for publications like this one that go much more in depth to some of the technical issues around designing and implementing reparations programs. And just one thing you can see on the slides, the reminders, I think these are well known to, to all of you in the room at this point, but as a baseline, I just wanted to reestablish those um, key concepts of reparations and, and highlight also a key point um, that's been touched on in the presentation before us, the inherent paradox of reparations that you know, these programs are seeking to repair the irreparable. And so with that challenge in mind at the core of what this work is about, it's extremely important to involve the beneficiaries in the design and implementation as this public hearing is doing today. It's also important to note that in general, one measure or one type of reparations will not be enough. And therefore a mix of approaches and initiatives can help increase the chances that these programs will feel reparative to different people who have had different experiences. Next slide, please. So another reminder is to I think this is, you know, often said, but, you know, when people hear the word reparations, the first thing that comes to mind is often individual cash payments. And those are an important and essential part of reparations programs. But we also want to emphasize that reparations can be and should be much more than cash payments. As the UN Basic Principles uh, from 2005 highlighted, reparations include compensation, which can be one-time payments, but also you wanna think about more sustained forms of material compensation through pensions and other scholarships, other such initiatives. It also includes the restitution of rights. And this could include the expungement of criminal records, for example. I know that's something that's already happening, but perhaps looking at this issue through a reparative framework, the state could al allocate more resources to support um, creation, for example, an office that would make an expun expungement process much more simple uh, for those who qualify. Reparations would also seek satisfaction. This could include an official apology, or revealing the truth about what happened. As was noted in the panel just before, the importance of the public hearings in really sharing what took place, the impact of those violations to the present day should not be underestimated. And finally, thinking also about guarantees of non-recurrence, which include changes in laws and policy. Next slide, please. I just wanna point out that these UN basic principles were drafted in 2005 at a time when people weren't thinking about contexts such as the United States or Canada or Australia or Europe, where there are long-term systemic, multi-generational um, systems of, of harm and discrimination that are being looked at. These discussions were focused more on immediate post-conflict or post-authoritarian context. So as we think about reparations in the US context, and as we're looking at international examples, it's important for us to keep in mind that this context requires us to be a bit more innovative and think not just about addressing the immediate reasons and consequences of the crimes being looked at, but also to address the political and structural inequalities that allow these violations to take place in the first, in the first place. And so referring back to the image shared by Mr. 
Wakabayashi of the equality and equity um, model. You know, he asked at the end, who put the fence there? Um, so here, if we're thinking about really transformative reparations, not just about giving people the stools or the benches they need to see over the fence. It's really about asking, how do we get rid of that fence? And how do we make sure no more fences keep going up so that people won't need those stools anymore? Next slide, please. And actually, uh, on that last slide, it's okay, you can stay here. There was a, a billboard, um, and that was part of, yes, it, it asks, can we move forward without confronting our past? And as you think about public education around uh, the reparations um, program that you will design and we're at the implementation phase, I think there's been a lot of creative work around thinking about how to reclaim public spaces, in this case, not for advertising, but for getting people to reflect on critical questions facing our society. So this was part of the Four Freedoms Project uh, led by artists from an, actually an artist uh, based in Los Angeles. Um, just one of many ideas that you can also think about as you start rolling out the, the reparations proposals. Thank you, next slide. So now with those general points in mind, we're gonna focus on a few case studies, Canada, South Africa, and Germany, just to extract some relevant lessons. And I mentioned Canada, you know, our neighbor to the north, in part because it's a similar context as the United States of established consolidated democracy, a fair amount of infrastructure and resources. So what can be done in a context like Canada or the US is much more than other contexts where we work, you know, where it's post-conflict and there's not the infrastructure to support complicated uh, programs. In Canada, what they had was a settlement agreement where um, churches, uh, First Nations people and the government of Canada entered into a settlement agreement to deal with the legacy of the Indian residential schools, which is very similar to the boarding schools that we've had in the United States. This was a government-run, church-implemented policy by which indigenous children were taken from their homes forcibly and put in boarding schools where the intention was to kill the Indian and the child. So not only were these schools um, a tool of cultural genocide, there's also a massive um, physical, psychological, and sexual abuse. So when the government and the church is finally forced to reckon with this legacy, they came upon, you know, they designed a, a program that had multiple components. Again, recognizing that one initiative wouldn't be sufficient to address this legacy. So just to share a concrete example that could, again, a very different case in the United States, but might give some insights or some ideas. So they had two tiers of reparations within their program. One was the common experience payment for all former students who attended the residential schools. And the, the way it works is you, they tried to make the application process quite simple and the burden of proof also quite simple. So it was a four page application process that you had to fill out. And as a first step, the government would then run the person's name and the school they went to through a database that had all of their records to see if there was a match. If there was no match, they would then go through the information manually. And if there was still no match, they would only then go back to the person who had applied to try and get some further information. And each student was eligible for 10,000 Canadian dollars for the first year they attended, and then $3,000 for each year after that. The average payout was 20,000. Uh, 457 Canadian dollars. And that, so it was called the common experience payment. The idea was to not put a heavy burden of proof on, on former students to recognize that regardless of your personal experience in the school, the system was uh, a violation of their rights and they were entitled to repair. For those who experienced particular harms in addition to being in school, so extreme um, physical and sexual abuse, they had the choice to then go forward um, and, and take part in the independent assessment process. That process was a bit more court-like in the sense that you had to provide a bit more detailed evidence about what you suffered. You had to sometimes retell in detail what happened to you, but the, reward, the 
the uh, reparations benefit was much higher, the average 100,000 Canadian dollars. In addition to that, there were other measures to support healing. There was a fund by which communities could apply to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for funds to implement and design, to design and implement their own um, commemorative initiative in their community. So that's something to think about as well is providing the benefit to, to everyone, but then also allowing, keeping some funds open for communities to design what they think would be repertory in their particular locality. Um, and then finally, there was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which provided a space for survivors to come forward and tell their stories, have them be officially heard and acknowledged um, by the TRC. And, you know, I think there was a, a recent review looking at the common experience payment. And I just want to share a few findings from the study that interviewed participants a few years after they received their benefits. And I think some of these, um, some of the findings from this report raise important points to consider as you think about developing and implementing reparations in California. So the first um, statistic was that 40% of the participants found the process of application logistically and emotional, emotionally challenging. 20% found a long wait caused extreme anxiety. And even though you know the government of Canada had prepared um, um, a toll-free line and other services to help former students go through the application process, many still felt it was quite a challenging uh, process. And for the 25% of applicants who were involved in a reconsideration request, they were then made to prove their attendance. And many reported that the way in which that process took place, they were made to feel like liars. So that brings you know, an important point forward in thinking about reparations. It's not just about the benefit that will be given, but it's also the way in which that benefit is given and ensuring that every step along that process is reparatory and done in a way that honors and dignifies the persons receiving the benefits. Another challenge, um, many of the participants noted that overall they felt positive impacts for receiving the common experience payment. But for those who felt a negative impact, they noted that the lack of plan on the part of the implementers to sufficiently prepare for the triggers, the self-destructive reactions, and the predatory behaviors had a very significant negative impact on them. There were many cases, unfortunately, of people receiving their $25,000 check in the mail, but not having a bank account. And people knew these checks were coming. And so they would go to these communities and offer to cash the checks for them. But it, you know, it ensnared them in a whole bunch of predatory schemes uh, for people who didn't have the right financial infrastructure to receive these payments. Or others who were still on their healing journey, that influx of cash fed into self-destructive uh, reactions with a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. Um, so it's important to really think about what is the benefit, how it will be implemented, and how to think about the logistical challenges of implementation and also the emotional challenges. And on that point, this report found that in Canada, they, like I said, they had some state-sponsored toll-free hotlines, and they also had provided funding to um, community-based healing organizations that already had an established relationship with the beneficiaries of this program. And in those, what they found is that the toll-free hotline, oftentimes participants felt that the operators were not sensitive to them, and it was re-traumatizing to call in with questions, whereas the support provided by the community-based healing projects was much more effective. So something to consider in California is having the state provide funds and support to organizations that are already working with the community that will be receiving reparations, that are already trusted, so that that support can feel, um, again, in the spirit of reparations. So with that, I'll turn over to my colleague, Ruben Carranza, and you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia, and thank you again for inviting uh, Virginia, Virginia and I. Um, I will talk about three countries and then a fourth one very quickly, uh, and hopefully I will have enough time to do all, all of them. South Africa is 
famous for, among other things, having an iconic truth commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in the picture, you can see Bishop Desmond Tutu in the center, uh, the chairperson of that commission. And right next to him, the white man is Alex Gray, uh, who was a president of the International Center for Transitional Justice. Uh, the two things that are important to remember about South Africa's Truth Commission, it was fairly successful in terms of public hearings, but it is important to remember and to know that the reparations program that followed the South Africa Truth Commission was not as successful as the Truth Commission's work. In South Africa, apartheid officially went on from 1948 to 1990 for 42 years. The Truth Commission operated for seven years from 1995 to 2002. Uh, the clear lesson in our experience having worked in South Africa is that a truth commission is not enough. Public hearings will not be enough. Reparations, material and symbolic, is the most direct and impactful form of acknowledging victims of apartheid, of racial segregation in their case. Uh, the truth commission of South Africa, next slide please. The truth commission of South Africa recommended $3,500 a year for six years as reparation. Was it for all victims? No, it was only for those victims who registered at the Truth Commission. And only those who were victims or survivors or family members of those who were murdered, tortured, and disappeared forcibly during apartheid were qualified to register and to receive reparations. But even this recommendation of 3,500 a year for six years from the Truth Commission was not in fact implemented by the South African government uh, that followed apartheid. What did the government implement instead? Instead, the government offered a one-time payment of about $3,000 lump sum for 21,000 individuals who were registered as victims at the Truth Commission. It was only later that the Truth Commission and the government also offered access to education and community reparations for specific communities that were impacted by the physical integrity violations committed during apartheid. One of the lessons that to us is important to emphasize about this reparations program that followed the South Africa Truth Commission is that the period to apply for reparations should not only be one period. In other words, it's important to consider having different periods of time over a longer stretch that allows individuals to apply for reparations, not just one time and not just within a specific um, duration. The other lesson is the idea of community reparations that, uh, as I understand it, the California Task Force might still be able to consider when it makes recommendations targeted to communities impacted by the violations that are within the mandate of the task force and designed so that they benefit the entire community, even those who might not necessarily benefit individually from compensation. Next slide, please. The other country that is important to consider in terms of its experience is Chile. Chile has been implementing reparations for the last 21 years. In other words, the reparations program in Chile is still ongoing. This is for victims of the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Uh, in Chile, they have had two truth commissions and at least four successive reparations programs. They have spent 113 million as pension for families of those who were disappeared or unlawfully killed. Separately, Chile spent 195 million as pensions again for former political prisoners and victims of torture. And then another amount of $1.2 billion as compensation for persons who were dismissed from their employment on political grounds. And then finally, and one of the most important aspects of the continuing reparations program in Chile, a program called Praís in Spanish, which is 
a comprehensive health care program originally meant for survivors of torture, but gradually expanded to cover the family members of those who survived torture, the family members of those who were killed or disappeared, even the lawyers of those family members and survivors. In other words, this is an example of an ever-expanding set of reparations that depended on what the government discovered were needed by victims of the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, and at the same time, were also dependent on the resources available to the government of Chile. Uh, it's important to note the Chile experience in relation to the South African experience, because in South Africa, as I said, you had a one-time payment and then a set of community reparations. In Chile, you had combinations of all of this, including not just compensation in the form of pensions given over time, but also a healthcare program that was specifically and separately funded and meant for victims of human rights violations. Next slide, please. Another example of incremental reparations being given is Germany, and many of you will be familiar with Holocaust reparations. But it's important to emphasize the programs of reparation implemented first by the then West Germany and later by the Unified Germany did not only benefit Jewish families who were targeted during the Holocaust, but also benefited Roma families, Sinti families, as well as LGBT families who were targeted by the Nazi regime. They also created a separate reparations program for individuals who were forced to work for the Nazi regime. So the, the Holocaust reparations program began in 1952, just a few years after the end of World War II, but it continued late into the 2000s, implemented across the world because there were beneficiaries who no longer lived in Germany or even in the rest of Europe, but lived in Israel, lived in the Soviet Union, or even in the United States. So again, an important aspect of Germany's reparations experience is that it incrementally implemented reparations for different sets of victims and different types of violations that took place during the Nazi period during World War II. Next slide, please. So just to summarize where we are so far in the ITTJ presentation, we think that in designing and implementing reparations in California based on the mandate of the task force, the state should consider other forms of reparation, not just compensation. And I understand this is already in the interim report of the task force, including access to education in state universities and expunging criminal records and the experience of the Japanese American um, litigation in the Supreme Court, Korematsu and similar cases is illustrative of this. It's also important to generate funding for reparations from those who profited from slavery even up to now. So one of the most important aspects of reparations design and implementation is to figure out funding and not just to figure out the forms of compensation or even the amounts of compensation. Um, a third point that we might want to say now, explicitly make reparations payments tax exempt. Many reparations laws we've seen across the world do not make this explicit and it becomes a problem in some cases. Um, a fourth point to consider in design and implementation, explore collective reparations for neighborhoods or communities that were impacted by the consequences of slavery. And we stress impacted by the consequences of slavery and not necessarily individuals who might be descendants of slaves or former slaves. Uh, we've worked, for example, in Liberia, where a number of former slaves went and settled and created their own country. And so one technical question would be, what happened to the descendants of those people? Are they covered? Are they not covered? So it's important to consider other forms of reparation that might cover a larger universe of beneficiaries. Next slide, please. What can California learn from other countries' reparations experiences, including those that I've mentioned? First, reparations do not have to be offered and implemented in one step. 
They can be done incrementally. They can be expanded based on resources. And to spelling that tells you that there are other victims, that there are other violations that have to be addressed. Second, they can be sequenced based on the forms of reparation that you provide, based on the types of beneficiaries you want to prioritize, and based on the resources that you have. Third, and we and my colleague Virginia mentioned these international legal standards earlier. International legal standards are just that standards. They are not inflexible. Uh, they can combine different material and symbolic forms, but they all prioritize acknowledgement as the goal of reparation. Finally, California can have more than one reparation policy and should consider successive reparation program. Program. So. I would like to call your attention to a publication that uh, Virginie co-wrote with another colleague of ours, and it's The Color of Justice, Transitional Justice, and the Legacy of Slavery and Racism in the U.S. And there's a quote here from Sherilyn Eiffel, who uh, said this during an ICTJ event a few years ago on reparations for slavery. She said, our nation has a habit of avoiding the truth. Just look at the Constitution. Look at the length our founders went to avoid using the word, word slavery. So to end, we work in one more country that I want to mention. It's called the Gambia. And for those of you who have seen and read the book Roots and seen the TV series and previous movies based on the book Roots, you will remember Kunta Kinte, the character. The story of Kunta Kinte, in fact, begins in the Gambia, where he was captured by a slave trader, put in a dungeon, which is in the Gambia, where I visited when I went to work there, and then taken from the Gambia all the way across the Atlantic to what is now Maryland, where there is a monument to Kunta Kinte. The island in the Gambia, there's a memorial remembering those who were enslaved from Africa, and you can see that in the pictures in the slide. And then it proceeds to another memorial in Maryland, in Annapolis, showing Kunta Kinte. We think that it's important to address root causes that led to slavery, that led to racial injustice. But those root causes are not just rooted in the United States, but rooted in imperialism and the initial stages of capitalism that led to enslavement. It's a form of uh, economic accumulation. So it's important to address these roots. It's important to look at the larger history of slavery when reparations are designed and implemented. Uh, to end, and if there are any questions that we can't answer today, uh, our emails are there, Ruben Caranza and Virginie Ladish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carranza and Ms. Lassic for your expert testimony. In the interest of time, we're gonna move forward with our next expert witness and then ask task force members for any comments or questions they might have uh, for all the witnesses that we heard from today. The next witness is Jonathan Bush. Professor Jonathan Bush, a lawyer and author who has written in wi widely on international law, legal history, and the Holocaust, is a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School. He teaches courses on Nuremberg, war crimes, human rights, and the Holocaust, and other human rights reparations. Attorney Bush has held full-year fellowships at the New York Public Library, the National Humanities Center, Princeton's Institute for Advanced Studies, and the U.S. Holocaust Museum, and previously served as one of the museum's two founding co-general counsel. A staff prosecutor from 1980 to 1983 with the Criminal Division U.S. Justice Department in the Office of Special Investi Investigations, which pursued and prosecuted Nazi war criminals, he clerked for a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals Second Circuit, and before that earned degrees from Princeton, Oxford, and Yale. Attorney Bush has co-edited co two legal history books and is writing a biography of Telford Taylor, chief prosecutor at 12 of the 13 Nuremberg trials. 
He has taught part-time at three law schools and full-time at three others, laterally at the University of Texas. Without further ado, we'll now turn to Professor Jonathan Bush. You may begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Moore. Can I, uh, Chair Moore, can I be heard? Yes, you may be heard. Sorry, we've changed uh, technologies a few times. Thank you very much for that um, extravagant um, and generous introduction, and thank you for the honor of inviting me to speak before you and your um, eight colleagues uh, on the commission. Um, I'm honored and I'm also really happy to learn from my fellow witnesses, which I've been doing. Um, with your permission, I'm going to jump straight into things. Um, I know that this panel officially is called Examples and the afternoon's panel is called Principles. And my, I'd like to tell a few stories from the international law and legal history that I work with, and some of them are examples and some of them are principles. So I'll sort of go from one to the other. I believe they're relevant. I like other speakers. I would not dare to say that this or that example is comparable or this or that solution is comparable. I do, however, think that some of the older um, and recent legal results might be of relevance to you, to the commission. Um, I will cover a lot of ground lightly and therefore not give any documentation or too many details. If the commission wants, I can submit a written text with footnotes and bibliography. Um, but let me, let me speak now um, orally. Black reparations are old, long before Ta-Nehisi Coates, before Randall Robinson, before James Foreman, before the 1950s manifestos, there was Cali House. Long before that, there were reconstruction activists, and so on. In the early um, years of the 17th century, on which I have uh, written in the past, um, there are first-generation Africans who sued for freedom dues, for wages, and for land. So this goes, reparations, not just enslavement, goes back to the very, very start of our country. Um, these efforts fit comfortably within um, international law practice, which is really kind of twofold. Um, at the, I mean, at the broadest sense, after wars and revolutions and peace treaties, there have always been what we've called reparations. Um, note that there's almost nothing about moral reconciliation, rehabilitation, nothing. And I'll come to that in a few minutes. This is about money and territory, or riches and territory. Secondly, there's always been uh, domestically what you might think of as restitution or compensation. You stole my cow, you stole my land, give it back. Oh, you've destroyed it? Well, then give me something else in exchange. You did things along the way, I want, I want punitive damages. But just domestic um, reparations of some sort. Mass disposition doesn't really fit into the latter model of private law. Usually it's done by treaty or legislation. And the large examples we know from the past, you know, of uh, um, royalists returning after the French Revolution saying, give me my my riches and palaces back, or, or British slave owners saying, give me compensation for all that I'm being forced to, to free, um, is done by treaty or legislation, rarely by domestic litigation. And we'll come to that in a few minutes. At the end of World War II, and this is really where I want to begin, um, you see both kinds of, of um, reparations programs. At the very beginning, in Yalta and in Potsdam, at the big uh, treaties, done by the big powers. Stalin insists there will be $20 billion of reparations. That's the term he uses. And this is back in the day when a billion was really a billion. Um, and that process started. The West uh, dismantled and gave entire factories to Russia, knowing that Russia was entitled to the lion's share of these reparations. France, meanwhile, took its own, as did lots of other uh, countries. The US was giving this kind of state-to-state -state reparations to Russia to the Soviet Union as late as 1949. So pretty much when we ended our occupation, we were still giving things. Um, at the same time, there's desperate poverty all through the European continent. Um, in the US zone, at one time, there were as many as 13 million refugees. And the zone was only, you know, wasn't that large. 
southern Germany, basically. Um, we were down to giving people um, 1,100, almost 1,200 calories per day below starvation was the diet that we could afford to give. So everywhere in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, in two dozen countries, there are starving people, refugees, ex coming home or coming to where they want to be and saying, um, that was mine. I want it back. And the result is that in all sorts of countries, you see a creaking, groaning, breaking private law system where the law has to make adjustments and doctrinal changes. Okay, we'll assume this because how many people coming home from a death camp have their title deeds to their property with them? Within Germany, um, there's no way, within Europe as a whole or within Germany, there's no way to know how much was given at the beginning. When we speak of reparations, when the State Department puts on its website now, pursuant to statute, their estimate that $86 billion was given by Germany um, to uh, Holocaust, to Jewish Holocaust survivors, they do not include this. And this was the lion's share. And it's one of the themes of reparation. But let me, let me come to that in a second. Um, one reason, though, we look to this post-war practice is that, that there's a lot of money involved. You know, as soon as I say $86 billion, you usually have the undivided attention of anyone working in modern reparations. And that is why everyone from sober tax lawyers like Boris Bicker to activists and writers like, like Coates or Randall Robinson to congressmen like, like Conyers, like John Conyers, even to Fidel Castro in the Durban conference in 2001, all say Germany paid the Jews. Let's look at what they really did very briefly. This is not my point to give history, but to give um, history that relates. Starting in 1947, uh, the US and France in our respective occupation zones started saying that um, we would give real property back to legitimate claimants and non-fungible property. Um, these are small programs. They don't amount to much because as we've just heard for Canada, the, uh, the difficulty probably magnified here of victims coming up with documentation after they're coming home from a camp, um, was virtually impossible. And in fact, the, law was the laws were drafted really poorly because of exchange control. We didn't want people getting land there and then selling it with different currencies. And we actually said at the beginning, you can have your house if you can prove it and if you live there. Um, this wasn't going very far. So as soon as Germany gets a little bit of its sovereignty back in 1949, they set up indemnification programs. Um, the initials are BEG, there's lots and lots of law about it. Eventually, people can claim for jobs, pensions, interrupted schooling, um, personal injury, medical costs, and so on. It sounds fantastic, and over the next decade, the amount given was very large. Most of the claimants were not Jewish by any means. Most of them are Germans who were expelled from, who were fleeing from the East, who were bombed within. The German Constitution has as a clause in it called the equalization of all burden provision. And this is what it's meant for. And it also didn't go to where most of the non-Jewish victims were, which was in Eastern Europe, because those countries didn't recognize the Western regime. They didn't want to legitimize it by taking money um, until the Soviets were satisfied and, and so on. So it's a very limited program, but the money amounts get very large. At the same time, Germany also trying to get the monkey of, of guilt, of hatred off its back, enters into state-to-state -state treaties with Norway, with Greece, and most famously with Israel starting in 1952, where they give um, lump sums or sums paid over years in the billions to these countries. Finally, um, the, the final element to reparations in this first phase is claims against corporations for slave labor. It's probably what you've heard about the most because it's what Germany ended up paying the most for 50 years later. But claims in the 50s and 60s went absolutely nowhere. A few companies, mainly those selling retail goods in the Western market, like Volkswagen and Mercedes, made model, modest settlements, you know, in the neighborhood of three or four hundred dollars per survivor. And when they found more survivors coming forward, they reduced the payments, saying we don't the pot isn't that big. When a class action was brought in the US, in DC, in federal court, um, because IG Farben, one of the giant companies, had lots of money tied up in the US Treasury. The DC Circuit throws up its hands and saying, this isn't our business. We don't give reparations. Germany is taking care of this. And we can't handle 200,000, a class of 200,000 
plaintiffs. That was for Auschwitz. So the, the, the lesson of the story, weirdly enough, is that by around 1970, Germany feels is that the, the program is closed unless you file by 69. So um, Germany feels we've done enough. We've done lots. And they have, mostly to their own people. Israel feels you've given lots to us because they had. Almost no one else feels that Germany has done enough in the survivor and Holocaust community. But here's the, here's the, uh, the wrinkle. Here's the, the mystery to it all. The rest of the world had a creative misunderstanding or reinterpretation. Because all around the world, and I'm talking of, around 1970, people started accepting that Germany seems to have taken care of what it has done, its mass atrocities, and therefore we can do it too. Why not others? And you see literally that, that you know, the direct reference in all sorts of um, writings and speeches from the time um, in, in the African-American reparations, which uh, get another boost um, in Japanese-American circles, um, which I think is a critical point and I, a critical movement. And I'm, I'm delighted we heard from it today because it really changes things uh, uh, in the sense of saying money isn't enough. We need historical truth. We need um, reconciliations and apology. These German programs, as of 1970, they, the domestic ones resemble Social Security Administration. They just need to qualify, you get your money. There's no apology. The country to country things always come with Germany saying, this is not in respect of any fault we may or may not have done. This is like foreign aid to a country, a neighbor that we hear needs help, not a country that we are. Um, uh, committed massive crimes on. So the Japanese American example is really one of the first successful programs that brings in um, cultural and moral dimension, which is critical. But in the 80s, all sorts of other people are picking up on this model. Reparations are getting normalized. The Second Circuit in a very famous Philartica case finds an ancient statute from 1791 that's essentially never been used and says that uh, victims of international crimes Anywhere in the world can sue in the U.S. Now, it, it gets off to a slow start. But again, if you want to see the comparison, four years before the Second Circuit had dismissed a reparations claim saying, this is the last one of these we want to hear. This stuff doesn't belong in U.S. courts. So there really is something in the air, whether it's Japanese-American activism, whether it's the human rights emphasis of Jimmy Carter, of the Carter administration, I don't know. But suddenly you start seeing uh, there are 200-odd cases within a a decade or so uh, under uh, against multinationals for big money. The South African process that we've heard about uh, starts in the 90s. Uh, all around South and Central America, there are, um, in effect, transitional justice post junta cases that we've also heard about in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, uh, the UN does it after the first Iraq-Kuwait war. There's a massive uh, reparations fund. No no talk of fault, no talk of apology, but like the earlier German cases, big money. And if you look at the UN deliberations, everybody's rhetoric is, Germany did this after World War II, why can't we do it now? And it's even true of cultural property and art. Um, we, um, uh, we're all with the start of, of an impulse to give things back. If you want, the ultimate irony is that this misunderstanding of what Germany had done comes back and gives new life to Holocaust reparations, which in the 90s, the various German statutory funds get expanded to cover things like non-survivor widows of survivors or kinder transport or medical uh, special funds for medical experimentation victims, um, et cetera. Um, and eventually when the Cold War ends and the, and the Iron Curtain comes down, they, take, they tackle the last big uh, class of uncompensated victims, which are Eastern European, mostly non-Jewish, Eastern European slave laborers who had never been able to claim until the end of the Cold War. Um, but what an irony that, 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 that Holocaust reparations really uh, expand radically um, because of the way earlier Holocaust reparations have been misunderstood and expanded uh, all around the world. Um, and around the same time, and I'm, I'm talking now about two, uh, tw uh, 2000, um, there's Swiss bank funds, there's Italian insurance company funds, the woman in gold painting is given back as a Washington conference where every country pledges what it will do to give back looted cultural property. Um, 
there seems to be another uptick in the black reparations activism. Uh, the uh, California Senate uh, passes its uh, insurance disclosure bill in, in, in 2000, the first, I believe, and everyone else you will know better than me, I think the first call for California Reparations Commission is 2001. Uh, the first Tulsa case is brought in 2003. Um, Ms. Farmer Paleman, who I, whose work I greatly admire, brings her first case, I believe, in 2002, and so on. And there's an explosion of apologies as Britain apologizes to Ireland and, and um, the popes ap apologize for pedophilia and, 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 and so on. Canada ap apologizes for its First Nations. So if all this is true by around 2000, if there's an effect, a successful resolution by this misunderstanding of Holocaust reparations, why are we still fighting? What's the problem? Why doesn't uh, the California proposal just sail through with a unanimous bill? I think there are two reasons. One is, as you'd expect, practicality, and one is politics. The practicality is, of course, lots of people don't really want to give and won't. The political will is missing. If you just want to take the easy example of art, the Soviet Union, which um, under the Yeltsin administration admitted that it had taken uh, something like 300,000 art, major artworks and keeping them as trophy art, things that have been kept secret. Off, you know, more reparations for World War II, they said, uh, under President Putin, as you can imagine, that is no longer on the table of giving that back. Um, even Germany, when it discovered 300 old masters and fabulous oil paintings in a, the apartment of a, Munich, of a son of a Munich uh, art trafficker, decided that they, it was too complicated to find the former Jewish owners. Three or four were given to uh, former owners. The other 295 are going to a new museum in Switzerland. Um, Eastern European countries consistently have announced that they will not give, that they were victims, not perpetrators, and that they will not give land, even uh, synagogues and cemeteries, uh, back to things like Jewish communities or Roma and Sinti people, um, and so on. So that, that's sort of the, what you'd expect. I mean, Austria, with much ado, finally willing to say that it's at fault as the home of Hitler, um, sets up a little bit of reparations, but for publicly owned land that had previously been owned by Jews, um, it's basically land on the side of highways that was claimed for eminent domain and then not used. It's tiny um, and very few of the cases win. And a leading historian and activist, Stephen Temple, who wrote about this, was put in prison in Austria in 2015 for, you know, fraud and defamation and things like that. It, you know, a lot, the political will is not really there. And of course, there's poverty. Um, so we heard about uh, the tiny amounts given in South Africa, um, that they dwarf the even tinier amounts given in Cambodia. What do you do with a country where everybody, almost everybody, was a victim, that's desperately poor now, and where the dozen or so elderly people put on trial are judgment-proof? Where's the money coming from? At a recent check, I saw that a total of 770000 have been donated, $1,000. Not millions, not billions. So those are the practical sides. What about legal impediments? And that is really what I'm supposed to be talking about, I guess, principles. Um, let me just rattle off three or four and then try and end on a, a happier note, because I think none of these are disabling. One, there is no international law requirement for reparations. There's a lot of soft law. There's a lot of principles. There's a lot of hopes. There's a lot of you really ought to, you can, and you should. There is no hard law. And in fact, on the other hand, um, the ICJ, when faced with a major suit by Italy and Greece against Germany, well, actually the other way around, Germany against those two, affirmed the old rule saying sovereigns are absolutely immune if they choose to be. That's 2012, and it has not been changed. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has rapidly retreated from all sorts of the doctrines that I just ticked off. They've totally gotten rid of, almost totally gotten rid of the ATS, the Alien Tort Statute. Um, there's right now a small case in which a Vietnamese uh, victim of Agent Orange who had lost in the U.S. is trying to get money in France. I don't think she'll win. And the ATS was really an American freak, this moment where human rights idealism met the American personal injury law industry. And that doesn't exist overseas. Uh, the Supreme Court in the last two years has narrowed sharply 
possibly putting it cutting out professor bush you're cutting out now uh, but in the interest of time um, can you summarize and close yes i'm happy in court there's bill and be Professor Bush, you're cutting out. Thank you so much, Professor sorry, Bush. Just, uh... Thank you so much, Professor Bush. Am I there? Hello? Yes, you're here. So if you can just do some quick closing can words, because we're having some technical difficulties, so we can't really hear you. Uh, as quickly as you can. While they're made, them apply here. This is not an against the state. This is not a judicial proceeding. All of those, have, this is a state finally opening its doors uh, to your expertise to do the right thing. Um, reparations are allowed, they are encouraged. And as we've heard from previous speakers, there is post 1970 a remarkable range of options and tools that can be brought to the table. Um, I will develop them more in whatever in writing I give you once. But for all purposes now, um, the problems that I've identified don't affect California. You have a, you can do what you want, and there are lots of wonderful models of successful reparations. And I, I look forward to seeing what you develop. Thank you so much, Professor Bush, Thank you. for your expert testimony. Everyone give him a hand. Very knowledgeable. So in the interest of time, we are 30 minutes over our lunch period. Uh, so we'll just continue to go to lunch. And if our ex if our um, task force members have any comments or questions um, related to this, uh, to these witnesses, um, we'll just reserve it for our second panel. Uh, so uh, we will recess now and return at 1.30. Thank you. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. So before we get started, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that a roll, uh, that a quorum can be reestablished. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin with the chair. Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Present. Vice Chair Brown is present. Um, Member Bradford. Member Bradford is absent. Member Grills. Member Grills is absent. Member Sawyer. Member Sawyer is absent. <clears throat> Member Holder. Present. Member Holder is present. Uh, Member Lewis. Member. Lewis is absent. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Uh, member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine task members and the number needed for a quorum is five. And let the record reflect that member Lewis is, is present as he just entered the room. There are <clears throat> Six members present, a quorum has been reestablished. Thank you. Now that a quorum has been reestablished, we'll return to our agenda. The next item on our agenda is item number 18. Witness panel, prin principles for effective reparations initiatives based on domestic and international human rights laws and norms. Um, we, I also wanna note that we have Professor Bush on the line listening um, in the event that task force members have any comments or questions for Professor Bush. Any comments or questions for Professor Bush at this time? We'll now uh, turn to um, introducing our first witness, 
which is Michael Cochin. He's here. Um, he's remote. He's joining us remotely. Michael X. Cochin is a professor in the School of Political Science, Government, and International Relations at Tel Aviv University. He received his A.B. in mathematics from Harvard and his at 19 from Harvard and his M.A. and Ph.D. in political science from the University of Chicago. He has held visiting appointments at Yale, Princeton, Toronto, Claremont McKenna College, and the Catholic University of America. Professor Cochin has written widely on the comparative analysis of institutions, political thought, political economy, politics, and literature, and political rhetoric. He has published four books, including An Independent Empire, Diplomacy and War, and The Making of the United States with the historian Michael Taylor. Before Mr. Cochin presents, um, in the interest of time, I'm asking expert witnesses to truncate their testimony. So unfortunately, I'm sorry about that because our, of our technical difficulties. So if you can, please conclude um, within 10 minutes. Mr. Colchin, if we have him ready, he may present. When... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for agreeing to take my presentation remotely. I say at the beginning, I speak as an American academic, a political philosopher and historian of the United States, and not on behalf of my institution, Tel Aviv University, itself a recipient of Holocaust reparations. I was trained in political philosophy, that is to look for the questions not asked, and see asking those questions changes, asking those questions changes our thinking on the questions usually asked in public debate. My goal in the next few minutes is to shock you into thinking a bit differently about some very familiar questions. Now, the pressure for reparations from American slavery comes from two sides. First, from moral outrage. It is part of a legacy that in other respects and for other reasons, we Americans are not ashamed of but proud to claim, right? That is, as Americans, we participate and aim to perpetuate institutions, the union of the states, the constitution, the free market, that a century and a half ago actively worked to hold innocent men, women, and children in wrongful slavery. Second, Pressure for slavery reparations comes from the recognition of persistent caste-like inequality between the descent of persons held as slaves in the United States and other Americans. As I wrote in, in 2018, summarizing other people's research, the descendants of American slaves with shorter lives than other Americans are less likely to have stable families, are more likely to be victims of violence, have lower incomes, less wealth, and lower levels of educational attainment. As Americans, dedicated, as Lincoln said, to the proposition that all men are created equal, this persistent inequality outrages us. This outrage is all the worse because it is incoherent. It is incoherent because we do not have a current term or word that marks out the people whose unequal condition today outrages us. The relevant category is not a racial category. We do not feel the same obligation to mitigate inequalities toward black immigrants and their descendants, even black immigrants from other places outside the United States where black men, women, and children were held in legal slavery by whites or Europeans. The people who, whose relative deprivation outrages us are not an organized community or people separate from other Americans. We are not speaking of a nation or, what in, or, or of what in political science is called an intentional community. We all know or should know the exchange from Jordan Peele's 2019 horror movie, Us, a film that is an allegory of the relations between privileged and less privileged black Americans. What are you people, asked father to black upper middle class family, Gabe Wilson, of their newly emerged clone rivals and enemies? And the answer comes, we're Americans. The problem with reparations is to find some way of mitigating inequalities that distinguish some Americans from other Americans in order to atone for moral outrage that still stains the institutions that we Americans cherish and wish to continue. When we put the problem that way, we see that two frequently cited modern examples of reparations provide limited guidance in thinking about reparations for American slavery. In 1988, the United States government agreed to pay reparations to those Japanese Americans who were interned by the United States during World War II. Those payments were modest, almost token, $20,000 for each survivor of internment still alive in 1988, and were not intended to, nor could mitigate persistent inequality. Why were the payments so modest? Partly, I think, because the kind of persistent inequalities that concern us regarding the descent of persons held as slaves in the United States are simply not found in relation to Japanese Americans, whether we speak about those individuals who were interned, the generation of those interned, or their descendants. There's also the example of Holocaust reparations, which is cited by in Ted Nahisi's well-known essay, The Case for Reparations. 
those reparations were paid from one community, from one community to two other communities, from the German state to the Jewish community organized in various bodies, such as the World Jewish Congress and the Claims Conference, and from the German state to the state of Israel, the national state of the Jewish people. The whole point is to repair, by compensation in money and goods, the relation between one people and another, between Germans and Jews, and between the Federal Republic of Germany and the state of Israel. Even when the recipients are or were individuals, and when their claim is calculated on the basis of individual deprivation by Nazi crime. This matters because the state of Israel could use the payments it received for the benefit of Jewish Israelis. It had a parliament, a government, and a bureaucracy to debate and decide how to use reparations for the common benefit of the Jewish people, the collective victim of Nazi outrages. For slavery reparations, the problem is within a single community, the American people, and is an attempt to deal with the outrages that some Americans inflicted on other Americans through the American institutions that for other reasons and in other respects we esteem and wish to perpetuate. Unlike in the case of Holocaust reparations, reparations for American slavery, in whatever form it takes, will have to be worked out by the same institutions and for the same American people as both victims and perpetrators. Unlike in the case of reparations for Japanese Americans, also paid on behalf of Americans to Americans, the problem to be addressed by slavery reparations is not to symbolically to atone, but to respond to persistent inequalities which reparations should do something visible and tangible to mitigate. What about affirmative action? Well, I was asked to be here today because I published an essay in 2018, The Whipped Cream Boys of Affirmative Action, arguing that affirmative action programs of the kind that exist today are not a suitable vehicle for mitigating the persistent inequality between the descendants of persons held as slaves in America and other Americans. First and most important, they haven't worked. In fact, those inequalities such as crime victimization are in important respects, as bad, if not worse, today in 2022 as they were in 1965 when President Johnson announced his affirmative action policy in a speech at Howard University. The failure of affirmative action programs is obscured because government media, think tanks, and universities use racial categories such as black and white to study inequality instead of gathering separate data on the defense of persons held this place in the United States. Second, because in affirmative action policies are defined in racial terms, they are not an answer to the real problem. Reparations are for victims, and while it is true that slavery in America and everywhere else on the globe where slavery was practiced was racialized, in the United States of 2022, such programs as, as affirmative action that designate beneficiaries by race are not reaching those harmed by the persistent legacy of American slavery. In my view, California's response to the question of reparations should be to seek out programs that, in the light of more than half a century of modern experience, have some prospect of mitigating the relevant inequalities. Here, I think the best thing to focus on is education, and in particular education at the K-12 level. Make it easier for the descendants of persons held in slavery in the United States who live in California to get a good school education. My authority is California economist Thomas Sowell, a descendant of persons held as slaves in the United States, born in 1930 in Gastonia, South Carolina, amid the last living memories of American slavery. As Thomas Sowell details in his 2020 book, Charter Schools and Their Enemies, the 2019 California charter school reform legislation goes the wrong way, making it harder for impoverished parents, and I would add, especially for impoverished parents descended from persons held in slavery in America, to ensure that their children are enrolled in schools that will teach them adequately. Rather, California need to make sure that every California child, and in particular every California child of descendants of persons held in slavery in the United States, is guaranteed a free K-12 education. Education does not mean time in the classroom chair, between birth and prison, or birth in the street, education must mean actual scholastic attainment that will give these children and all California children the skills and talents required for a fulfilled adult life. Charter schools and easy access to them, Sowell shows, are a vital part of such an education policy. Because of the importance of school for remedying inequalities, California should annul or obliterate other public policies that stand in the way of educating each California child and descendant of persons held in slavery in the United States. And I speak as a unionized teacher, well aware of the benefits of unionization for teachers, especially uncommitted, distracted, or incompetent teachers. At the post-secondary level, I think the state can do is identify and increase access to programs that pipeline students from the classroom to rewarding careers. Such programs are often co-ops, where job placement is part of the curriculum, and students work at their careers through their time in school. The state of California, in my view, should identify inequalities in access to those programs. The state should then formulate, apply, study, reformulate, and reapply policies to mitigate those inequalities in the state of California. Race is fundamental to understanding the history and legacy of American slavery. 
But thinking beyond racial categories is vital to formulating and implementing public policies that will mitigate the inequalities that are the legacy of American slavery. If the Civil War settled one thing, it made all of us black and white Americans. Thus, it made the problem of repairing relations between the victims and perpetrators and perpetrating institutions a problem for all of us together as Americans. We Americans of 2022 want to find a policy response that will make us pos- make it possible for us to go on together as Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Colchin. Our next expert witness is Professor Jennifer Mason McAward. Jennifer Mason McAward is an associate professor of law at Notre Dame Law School and the director of the Clow Institute for Civil and Human Rights at Notre Dame's Co. School of Global Affairs. She received her undergraduate degree, summa cum laude, from Notre Dame in 1994, majoring in government and international relations and minoring in theology. Following law school, Professor Mason McAward served as a law clerk for Judge Alex Kozinski on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and then for the United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Her scholarship has explored the history of the Reconstruction Amendments and the scope of Congress's power to pass legislation to enforce the 13th Amendment. I'm extremely excited to have you, Professor Mason make a ward and you may begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Thank you so much. It's an honor to speak with you all today. I hope that some of my work on 13th Amendment enforcement law will be of use as you continue to think through the appropriate role that the state of California can and should play in addressing racial disparities and inequities. Section 2 of the 13th Amendment gives Congress the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And so the question that I've grappled with is what sorts of laws Congress can pass to enforce the ban on slavery and involuntary servitude. Uh, so Congress has been empowered to pass not just direct enforcement legislation banning, for example, human tra- trafficking, but also to pass all laws necessary and proper for abolishing all badges and incidents of slavery. And that concept of badges and incidents of slavery, which appears in your own work as the task force, originated with the 1883 Supreme Court decision in the civil rights cases. And it's since taken on canonical status as the outer boundaries of Congress's 13th Amendment enforcement power. And my scholarship has considered the roles of Congress and the Supreme Court in addressing the badges and incidents of slavery. And I've tried to come up with a definition. Uh, Incident of slavery was a legal term of art that referred to legal legal aspects of the institution of slavery, and badges of slavery was a more malleable term that referred to the broader set of political, civil, and legal disadvantages imposed on slaves, former slaves, and free black people. And so in determining what the badges and incidents of slavery are that Congress can regulate, I ask three questions. Whom can Congress protect, from what conduct, and by what actors? And in answering those questions, I looked at the historical record and considered structural separation of powers concerns. And ultimately, I concluded that badges and incidents of slavery have the following characteristics. First, they are policies or widespread practices that mirror a legal incident of slavery or infringe upon an aspect of liberty that was denied to slaves. Second, they're implemented by public or widespread private action. Third, they are aimed at disadvantaging African Americans or other populations that have been enslaved. And fourth, they point not remotely to a violation of Section 1 of the 13th Amendment. In other words, they pose an imminent threat to freedom or the ability to participate in the basic transactions of civil society. And the reason I included this final kind of causation element in my definition focused on kind of that idea of prophylactic legislation that incorporates these principles of separation of powers at the federal level, um, with the idea that we needed to have some kind of constraint on the legislature as well as a guide for effective judicial oversight. The important question here, though, is whether that same understanding should guide the exercise of California's own legislative power. 
and I am certainly not an expert on California law, but I do know that the California Constitution bans slavery and involuntary servitude and gives the California legislature plenary legislative authority to enforce that guarantee. And the law establishing this task force contemplates more than direct enforcement legislation, specifically laws that are aimed at the lingering negative effects of slavery. Um, and in many ways, the focus of this task force's work maps onto my conceptualization of the badges and incidents of slavery. Our work especially appears to align on the questions of actors and conduct. Uh, the findings of this task force, which recognize that slavery and its aftermath were the product not just of law, but of private conduct and custom, is, of course, entirely accurate. It's correlate that remedies must also engage public law and private systemic conduct reflects an important operational insight that can serve as a guide for legislative efforts. One place where our work might diverge is on this question of whether the conduct that's being regulated must have some kind of threshold causative impact to be properly the subject of legislation. But as I said, the reason that I included that in my definition draws from concerns about separation of powers principles. And it's not clear to me that those same structural concerns operate identically in the context of state reparations laws and policies. While the interim report does frequently address the ongoing system-wide impacts of racially discriminatory policies, it doesn't argue that those impacts currently violate or threaten to violate the California Constitution's ban on slavery. And so the question I asked myself is whether this is a problem, and the answer may well be no, because of the nature of the plenary state legislative power, as well as distinct separation of powers analysis for purposes of constitutional law. And so I simply just note that and raise it as a question for your consideration. One place, however, where our analyses might diverge more meaningfully is the question of who can receive remedies or reparations. And I know that this task force has dedicated time and study to this question and come up with a definition regarding eligibility. As I understand it, however, there's still a racial component to the definition you're using. In other words, it still depends on race. An indigenous Californian, for example, whose ancestors were also enslaved would not be eligible in the same way that a black person would be. And so the proposal is under-inclusive in the sense that only some people whose lineage includes slavery are eligible for reparations, but not all. Um, and so in the context of state reparations legislation, it is clear that the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause will be applied to guide and evaluate any legislative efforts. And so while not all of the task force's pre preliminary recommendations are race conscious, some of them are. And those strike me as requiring further analysis to determine their viability. As you surely know, the Supreme Court applies strict scrutiny to all racial classifications, saying that strict scrutiny applies whether a classification is invidious or benign. And it requires a showing of a compelling governmental interest as well as narrow tailoring. In a series of decisions, the court has rejected the idea that government can use race conscious action to remedy societal discrimination writ large, and has criticized that as an overbroad remedial interest. However, the court has said that remedying the present effects of the state's own past discriminatory conduct may be a compelling interest, as long as there's a strong basis in evidence to show that there has, in fact, been past discrimination and that remedial action is necessary. Uh, I raise this because, um, among other things, as you also surely know there's a, an affirmative action case pending at the Supreme Court this coming term. And given the composition of the court and the view of at least some of its members highly skeptical to race-based classifications in general, I just wanted to recommend that you closely follow the court's arguments and its upcoming decision. Even if the court, however, stands by its position that remedying specific past governmental discrimination is a compelling state interest, there would still be a, a question of how the preliminary recommendations of this task force might satisfy strict scrutiny and be deemed narrowly tailored. And again, I would just raise that for you to consider as you move toward final recommendations. Uh, my final point draws from that, which is that an effective reparations initiative must be, must be both implementable 
and implemented. And so even if you were to conclude that all of your proposals would withstand scrutiny, I just would think that you would also want to use as a criterion the likelihood of litigation. To what extent would something be likely to draw a legal challenge? Even if it wouldn't succeed, what would be the financial and logistical cost of advancing a particular recommendation versus the benefit of having it in place ultimately? And so that is where I will wrap up my testimony. But I just want to thank each of you. The knowledge and research that you have amassed is incredibly important. And it has been a real privilege to be a small part of the community that you're dialoguing with. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Professor Mason McAward. We had another witness lined up who would have been Mr. Alex Amaichi Ujugwa, who is a PhD at the University of Accra in Nigeria. But he is no longer able to make it. And so, and I'm looking back at the agenda, we have, that would place us actually, it's two o'clock right now. So we have 30 more minutes for this agenda item. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Professor Mason McAward, Professor Jonathan Bush, or Professor Cochin at this time? I also just want to apologize to our witnesses for the audio issues that we've been facing. I think that impacted a bit how much we internalized the information, but we tried our best. So thank you. Since we do have 30 extra minutes, we have Professor Jonathan Bush, Professor Cochin, and then Professor Mason McAward on the line. If you, does anyone have any comments or questions at this time? Because Member Holder, go ahead. Hello? Is it on? Doesn't sound like it's on, okay. <laughs> I, I just want to thank the panelists. I'm sorry that we have had some audio problems, but from what we were able to hear and glean, uh, it's very comprehensive and gives us a lot of insight as we move forward. I did have a question specifically for Professor McAward uh, regarding your 14th Amendment analysis and your equal protection analysis. Um, I'm specifically thinking about guarantees of non-repetition, which is, I don't know if you have been listening to the international perspective on reparations um, and the scholars that have spoken about that today, but one of the important international conventions for a reparations program is ensuring that there are guarantees of non-repetition. And I wanted to get a sense from uh, sort of a constitutional perspective, how that can be synthesized with the 14th Amendment and equal protection, because it's, it's, it's forward-looking, it's prospective. So you're not looking at present-day discrimination, you're almost looking at, at creating programs that safeguard against future prospective discrimination. And so from a constitutional perspective, uh, and from a strict scrutiny lens, how do you think that would play out? Thank you, Member Holder. Um, and I note that we are both NYU Law School graduates, so it's a particular honor to speak with you. Likewise. Um, it's interesting, thinking about um, non-repetition guarantees, I think typically we, we would think about that as kind of injunctive relief that could get entered in the course of a lawsuit. And I, I think it's an excellent point to think about how that would play out in a more legislative context, um, to think about how programs can safeguard against backsliding. It's, so my work has focused on kind of the, I, this idea of prophylactic legislation that can address something more than simply an actual constitutional violation in order to protect against future constitutional violations. And that strikes me as somewhat similar to what you're talking about. Um, and, but the question then is, how would that play out if a kind of prophylactic type of law were to be passed and then challenged under the Equal Protection Clause? Um, and I would, 
I would have to think um, more uh, about it. Um, but I, I guess the concern that I would raise is given this current court's um, deep skepticism toward any racial classifications, I just think that the law should be really as cleanly structured as it can be um, in order to try to uh, avoid as much litigation as might arise from it. Um, but I'd be happy to think through that um, more, more clearly and comprehensively at another point. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions for our expert witnesses from the task force at this time? I want to thank Professor Bush, Professor Colchin, and Professor Mason McAward for your expert testimony. Everyone give them a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so it is two o'clock. Um, our next item on the agenda is break, which would have occurred at 2.30 to 2.45. So now I'm turning to uh, the task force for any advice or counsel. Should we take a break now or move forward with the agenda, which would be planned for future meetings, including schedule, whether virtual, and subject matters to be addressed? All right, move forward. Okay, so we're going to move forward with the next item on our agenda, um, which will be um, facilitated by the DOJ um, with comments from myself and Jovan Scott Lewis. Okay, uh, are the slides able to be put up? We, we may need the extra time, so. Thank you very much. So uh, in this agenda item, uh, I, I plan to present uh, to you a few slides about the remaining work um, combined with a follow-up on the discussion we had yesterday regarding advisory committees, uh, and then leading into a plan for the future meetings schedule. So I'm sure you're reviewing those as you go. I will walk you through uh, the slides. So slides one and two outline the remaining task force work. Um, this work basically uh, boils down to uh, the work that was not covered in the interim report. Um, so what this work includes first uh, and foremost, uh, redressing the harms covered by each chapter of report one through specific remedies. Um, I'll come back to that, but essentially in, in plain language, that is taking the issues that the experts, the, rep, the uh, economics expert team talked about yesterday, converting that into uh, <coughs> concrete recommendations and the hard numbers around what reparations amounts are and how those reparations should be delivered. Okay, uh, I'm gonna circle back and uh, we'll talk about how we staff recommend that work be carried out between the task force through advisory committees, which I started talking about yesterday, uh, the experts that are retained for this, and then ensuring that the task force is engaged uh, at all decision points along the way. The, the second issue um, is somewhat dependent on the first issue, which is what other forms of other restitution and rehabilitation are warranted. This will be uh, subject to the task force's evaluation essentially after you have resolved um, the reparations that are gonna be tied to each of the existing chapters in the report. Uh, the next item, and this goes to the next page, number five, 
um, is the elimination of racist laws and policies. Uh, we have a retained expert that is working on developing a compendium uh, of all the racist laws uh, in the state. Um, we're working with them to, to work through uh, how those are delineated, how they're categorized, and then there will be a recommendation uh, pursuant to the statute from the task force about how those uh, laws should be eliminated. The next area of work is, uh, is on appropriate ways to educate the California public of the task force's findings. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, there's been some ideas around uh, creating curriculum so that uh, the task force report um, can serve as a you know, basis for educating children of all ages up through college. Uh, we are, as you can see, recommending that uh, the task force uh, instruct the Department of Justice to uh, retain an expert to work on this. Um, and finally, the, the last thing is how and when a formal, uh, how and what form a formal apology should take. Uh, that is gonna be something obviously that the task force will work through. So that is the remaining workload following what's set forth in AB 3121 uh, that was not covered or addressed in the first in the interim report. Does anybody have any questions about that? I hope that we remember that we carry in our pockets, our person possessions, AAA card. Whenever you need AAA after your car is broken down, they will always ask you. Are you in a safe space? And we say yes or no. It's very obvious from the discussion, from the responses here. We are not in a safe space when it comes to acknowledging that the crime against the humanity of black folks was wrong. But remember, AAA has three A's. And I would like to brown eyes those A's. The first A is to admit that you got a problem. Something's wrong. It appears to me that the low-hanging fruit is for us, as we go through our process concomitantly, push for this state and this present leadership to admit, give an apology. We can get running with that. Number two, there is atonement that's where actual reparations comes in. You have a plan, like it was, for that little man, Zacchaeus in the Bible. He told Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, that if I wronged anyone, I'm gonna pay back fourfold. That's reparations. And the final A is action. Action. And I think on yesterday we, we got the action plan moving to make sure that every member of the Assembly and the Senate has a copy of this report and including the governor. And that would get us on the road toward some action 
And then that's when all of us in the community who are really upset about this thing, you get involved too with some action. And that means getting all the sectors of our African-American community and our allies to start respectfully, peaceably, sensibly, factually, asking them to support reparations in this state. Thank you very much for that. I certainly appreciate that very much. Did you have a question, Javon? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so are there any other questions or comments about the um, work that is remaining to be done under the statute? Okay. So uh, we'll proceed to the third slide. Um, so you all uh, asked yesterday uh, for some proposals around um, how this work would be done in a way that engages the members of the task force and ensures that the task force is uh, working through the issues. Um, we uh, discussed internally um, and worked through an, uh, a concept um, for the creation of advisory committees as I alluded to yesterday. We talked about this a little bit, how that would look. And, uh, and there are a few, a few items that you'll, you'll need to vote on to put in action. But our recommendation is in order to uh, engage the task force directly in the work of working through these issues and making the decisions in a way that uh, you could be working directly with us and then we can bring items back to the task force for votes rather than waiting for the, the length of time between meetings for the DOJ to be working on and then come back each time uh, is to have uh, one or two advisory committees that would take on each of the five topics delineated by the experts uh, in their presentation yesterday as atrocities. Uh, those include unjust property takings by eminent domain, devaluation of black businesses, housing discrimination and houselessness, disproportionate black mass incarceration and over-policing, health harms, and then I have added into this list education because there was an extensive discussion yesterday about the need to really prioritize education. And uh, so our recommendation is to create either one advisory committee to work with the experts in the Department of Justice to work through the actual reparations framework um, for all, all of those items, uh, or to divide that work into two different advisory committees. And I've presented here a proposed way in which I think logically those, three, those six items can be grouped. So that's gonna be one advisory, one or two advisory committees. And those advisory committees are gonna to need to answer the five questions that were laid out. First, first thing is to answer the five questions that were laid out by the experts yesterday, which is the, the questions that they need answered in order to calculate what reparations looks like, what the amounts are, who would be getting the reparations, what are the damages. And so that would essentially be the, the first work of the advisory committees and then there will be as we discussed in the scope of work a little bit of back and forth between the advisory committee members and the experts with the Department of Justice attorneys facilitating that conversation and drafting up the proposals uh, eventually it will get to the we'll get to the future meetings plan and eventually the role will be the advisory committee members will then be presenting this information back in future task force meetings presenting the proposals uh, along with the experts which will, who will provide the factual data-based uh, case for reparations on each of those uh, items. So that's one set of advisory committees. And then if we go to the next page, uh, there's two additional advisory committees. One would be an advisory committee that would essentially work on everything else, all the other chapters that are not sort of taken up uh, with those six atrocity areas. Um, those include uh, enslavement, racial terror, political disenfranchisement, pathologizing the black family, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life, and the wealth gap. 
And the idea here is that those are, as we heard from the experts, not necessarily areas that can be uh, boiled down to an amount of damages or an amount of compensation, but there are going to be a number of policy recommendations that we can leverage the preliminary recommendations that were included in report in the interim report into some final general policy recommendations on each of those, which could be turned into legislative proposals or something like that and following the publication of the final report. And then the second advisory committee that we're recommending are what I've grouped together as remaining issues. And that includes uh, how we eliminate racist laws and policies, uh, what are appropriate ways to educate the California public on the task force's findings, and how and what form a formal apology should take. And each of those are rooted in one of the components of AB 3121. I'm trying to make sure that we check every single one of those boxes in that statute. Uh, you'll also see here a reminder of where the task force stands with regard to uh, existing or previous advisory committees. We have the Communications Advisory Committee, which is uh, Chair Moore and Member Grills, the Subpoena and Survey Advisory Committee, which are members Tamaki and Holder, uh, the Designee for the Bunch Center uh, contract, which is member Grills, uh, and then the Economic Experts Advisory Committee, which is essentially, as of yesterday, uh, really completed the work in terms of bringing on the economics expert team getting the contract going, figuring out the scope of work. Uh, for all intents and purposes, that work is completed. Uh, that was uh, Chair Moore and Member Lewis. And then um, the uh, Report Finalization Advisory Committee, which is sort of on hiatus until we get to Report 2. I did, I'm now realizing we left one thing off, which is uh, Chair Moore and Member Lewis uh, work on the uh, meeting ahead schedule and future meetings. So uh, that, that's part of that too. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Are there any questions about the staff recommendations? It's, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot. We're certainly the second part of this process is more work intensive, I think, for the members of the task force uh, in less, less focus maybe on, on, on the testimony and things like that. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. I mean Camila, you have anything you want to say first, or you all right? Okay. Um, Your mic's not. Can you not hear me? Now I can. Oh, you can? So, so thank you for the recommendations. I think, you know, I, I think, I understand, I, I understand the, the kind of, un, the, the, the argument for the economic expert, you know, a chair more myself, that stage of the work being done. Um, but I'm not quite, I'm not quite in, you know, in agreement that, you know, the role of us as a, as a advisory committee is done. I think there's a way to, you know, in my view, there is the, let's make sure I'm understanding myself here. Okay. So on the first page you have you know, the, the two categories that comprise about three areas each. Um, so this is the previous, the previous slide. So the staff recommendation, the first, yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. So I, I'm in total agreement that I think there should, there should be a, you know, an, ad, an advisory committee for that first cluster, an advisory committee for that second cluster. What I don't necessarily agree with is that the role of those advisory committees is actually to answer those five questions. I think the role of those advisory committees should be to further probe those areas. Um, you know, my concern is that there really is like a tick box approach to some of these things and we're, we're really not getting into a certain level of depth of what we're talking about here. So for example, let's just look at those first two clusters. You know, some of the kinds of questions that advisory committee could, could work with the economic experts on is saying, well, let's, you know, how can we identify all complicit parties in these acts? These aren't really questions we've even really asked, right? Um, you know, how do we think about the variances and calculations between one activity and another? 
So these are the kinds of things that I think an advisory committee should actually work with the, the economic experts on. Um, I think uh, a third advisory committee, which, which could perhaps be, you know, Chair Moore and myself continuing in our current role, you know, to actually, you know, work on those five questions, right? The kind of parameters, that kind of thing, because that would also have to be looked at from, I think, uh, someone of a higher scope, you know, to kind of think about, well, how do we think about um, qualification, damage timeframes across all of these different areas? So I, I think, I don't want to call it a hybrid approach, but I, I do want to make sure that we are paying significant attention to and devoting adequate time to a kind of deeper analysis and probing of, of these different areas. And I don't think that a model that's proposed accomplishes that. Um, so, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there, you know, as an alternative to, to this. I, and I think, just jumping ahead quickly, I have, I have a question about the hearing schedule. That's, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but that's not the hearing schedule that, that is in the agenda uh, materials and, or that Chair Moore and I submitted. So I'm not sure um, you know, what this one is. And the reason why I ask that is because the, the proposed hearing schedules that Chair Moore and I came up with actually did, I think, in a detailed manner, agendize some of the remaining uh, responsibilities or issues. And so I just want to make sure that I understand what this proposed hearing schedule is meant to do in relationship to that, because I think that would have some consequence on how we portion out some of the work. That, yes, that's correct. Um, I don't know, Chair Moore, were you, did you want to say something or not? Okay. Uh, yeah, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. So um, first and foremost, I'll talk about the hearing schedule, even yeah. though we haven't gotten there yet, but I'll talk about that. So that is correct. The, this is a sort of a staff recommendation hearing schedule. Your mm -hmm. hearing schedule is still right. in, in, the, in there. Okay. I essentially, tr one of the things I was attempting to do was uh, both uh, in response to some of the discussion yesterday um, about the timelines mm -hmm. um, and about the contents and how we would be approaching the, the different issues in the report that would be published uh, by June 30th, 2023, uh, as well as uh, pending a vote of the task force on whether to be in person or remote and whether to have it in the locations laid out as combined with the need to have these advisory committees working on this substance, trying to figure out a way, frankly, where we could manage getting outlines to you all on sort of the comprehensive mm -hmm. issues and then going through the drafting process again on the comprehensive issues as we go through. And part of this is why I recommended two task forces is mm -hmm. to sort of spread out right. the workload so that we could kind of be going on all cylinders on all of it. Um, so we'll come, we'll come back to the future meeting schedules. The second point you raised, which is the, the five questions. Uh, and I think you're right. That, that is another way that this could work, and, and that's fine. This is our recommendation. But the idea was definitely not that the advisory committees are only answering these five questions. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's what you thought I was uh, suggesting, but that's definitely not. I think you're right. I, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're recommending that they be split up and it not be one advisory committee doing all six. Mm -hmm. Because I think there will be to need to be that very deep dive. And again, as we've talked about with the advisory committees under the bagley Keene Act, the advisory committees are working with us and it'll eventually come back to the entire task force. And so back to the future meeting schedule, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity for something on each of these items to come back to the task force to weigh in to make sure the task force is, in, is invested and on board with what each of the advisory committees is developing along the way. So that also necessitated a little bit uh, of a switch in terms of accommodating mm -hmm. that time, because that's going to be pretty time consuming. If you, re if you think back to when we went through the drafts of the original report and the outlines of the original report, going through all of those different topics mm -hmm. is going to consume quite a bit of time in the meeting. Right. So I, I hope that answers your question. And obviously, you know, this is going to be, I'll come back and say what I need votes on mm -hmm. uh, before we finish this module. Uh, but that's certainly another way to go if, if you want to have uh, the existing um, expert in advisory committee of you and Chair Moore uh, handling these five questions essentially for, for all of the issues. That's certainly another way to go. The only complicating factor there is that two advisory committees can't 
communicate. Um, so you'll have to resolve that issue in a meeting where it's discussed amongst the whole, mm -hmm. the whole task force, and then each of the advisory committees will proceed based on whatever the outcome is of a mm -hmm. vote of the entire task force on the answers to these five questions. So we would need to probably, frankly, agendize the answers to the five questions for the, whatever the next meeting is. Mm -hmm. Chair Brown, you're recognized. Madam Chair. I would like to invite us to consider starting at age five and going forward. Mm -hmm. Why? Time is of the essence. And we made a commitment as a task force to do a job. And with what we've heard here, It's nothing new. We heard it from day one. And we can end up with information indigestion and actually I think we should look at the schedule and see if it's realistic and in no way become guilty of the allegation that's been made that we haven't heard everybody. We have a schedule. And my appeal as vice chair is that we would do all we can as humanly possible to move forward. Why finally? Let's face the reality of the present political climate in this nation and this state, and I would say even worldwide, with this populist movement stuff. You put your hand up and feel it. And we need to as Benjamin May said, he or she who's behind in the race of life is going to stay behind. He or she better run faster to catch up. It's time for us to run faster and catch up. Or else we're going to be left behind. And after the political bombshell comes, we still will not have made much traction toward getting our just due as black folk. Okay, and I'm making a, an appeal as chair since we are ahead of schedule that we actually take advantage of our break. So it's 2.30 and the break is from 2.30 to 2.45 and during this break, I think it would be good just for us to review the material um, a bit, kind of internalize it a bit, um, and then we can come back and see how task force members feel about what's on the page and if there's any alternatives, we can discuss that as well. Um, how does that sound? <laughs> okay. So we'll take our break since we are ahead of schedule and we'll resume at 2.45.